Hey everyone, we're back in the book of Romans, ending the chapter eight. So if you'd pray with me. Father, I pray that you'd be with us as we look into your word, that you might help us to understand new things. We might look at it with fresh eyes and that you might help our hearts and our minds to grasp your love for us. Pray that you might help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're picking it up in chapter eight. We're gonna go from verses 33 to 39. And basically, the whole chapter begins by saying, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh, but the spirit. In the middle, we know in it, uh, verse 28 says that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord for the called according to his purpose. And now in the ending section of chapter eight, he talks about there being no separation between us and God and that there'll be nothing to keep us from him. So as we get into it, I pulled Romans 8.35 as a highlight passage. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And of course, uh, the answer is there's no one who will separate us. So beginning with... the about the book of Romans. We're basically finishing up chapter eight, which talks about sin and sanctification. So we're gonna talk about the love of God primarily in the end here, chapter eight. The last couple of weeks, we've been going over this middle section of chapter eight, where it begins in verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we get into the passage, it's, it's one of the most remarkable passages anywhere found in the scripture about God's declarative love for us. And it would be do us well to have it memorized and to remember it because when things begin to go wrong in our lives, we need to remember God's commitment to us, his unconditional love for us. Beginning in verse 33, it says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Remember in the previous passage, it says those whom he called, he justified. That's one of the things that he did. And those that he justified, ultimately he glorifies. So he's picking up on this. Well, who is it that brings a charge against God's elect? Well, I don't know about you, but it could be any number of sources. It could be the devil. It could be my own conscience. It could be other people who think that I'm just not good enough and not smart enough or any, any number of things. And so people will throw guilt on you, guilt to the place where they say you're a bad person. I mean, Assessing blame to a person because of a particular behavior or an incident is one thing, but assessing evil to a person and holding them responsible uh, 
to the place where they can't repent, they can't apologize, they can never change. There's no room for that, then there's no grace in that. And so when he says, who is going to bring a charge against God elect? It is God who justifies. I mean, he's the one that takes away our shame. Shame is the stain that can never be removed from your soul. Those things that the devil loves to pull up to remind you about how you're not good enough or things that you've done that you'll never be able to live down or things that you remind yourself of that you can never forgive yourself for. Those are the very reasons that Jesus went to the cross. And it doesn't matter how angry somebody is and how they bring accusation and um, shame upon you. Jesus Christ came and died for our sins. And by placing my faith in his finished work on the cross, my sins have been taken away, my past, my present, and my future sins. So that I stand before God as a clean slate, always, perpetually. There are incidences where I have to come before God and deal with it, um, my failures, because I still fail. And yet I don't bear them. I don't carry them. I don't have to pay them off. I'm not going to sit in purgatory, you know, making big rocks into little rocks. I'm, I'm finished with all of that. And my job is to become more like Christ in my life. Jesus himself came and he still bears the marks of our salvation. And I, I remember that he still had scars and I think he'll be the only one that actually has scars in heaven. I think the rest of us will not, but they will always eternally speak of the price that was paid for my sin, for your sin. So, Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is one of those that I have memorized. And yet the next verse is just as important, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, because he gave us redemption. He redeemed us, bought us back from slavery to sin. And we're no longer slaves to our sins, so it doesn't tell us what to do. But he freely gave us this justification in which we could never earn and we certainly never deserve. Verse 34 says, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, even who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So the scripture speaks of us not being condemned. So who's the one who would point the finger at us and say that we're guilty? When God has said, he pronounces us innocent. When we have been justified and glorified as far as he's concerned, who is going to point the finger at you and assess that you are unworthy? If God has already said, you're good with me because of Jesus, who has a right to be unforgiving toward you? No one, not even yourself. And the devil, who is the accuser of the brethren, loves to remind us of all of our shortcomings. And yet, we don't have a right to remember them. And we don't have a right to recall on other people things of their past, their past sins. So who is the one who condemns? If God is truly saying you're okay, then who really has a right to bring an accusation against a believer? It says in John 3, 17 and 18, for God did not send a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So condemnation comes because we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And yet who can rightly bring an accusation against someone who's been forgiven totally of all of their sins? No one. And so I hope that you will be on the defense for accusations brought against you from Satan as a source, from others sometimes as a tool, or even your own conscience as a self-destructive measure, not to condemn yourself, beat yourself up, think you need to pay for your sins. Well, you know, I was, I was mean to my wife this morning, so that's going to be three days of her being cold to me. Or uh, my wife offended me, so I'm going to have a face on for the next week. That kind of stuff's got to stop because as far as God's concerned, you're already forgiven. It's a done deal. You just need to confess it and to get moving on with your life into the, the arena of repentance. But that holding on to those sins is something that's completely alien to the scriptures and should be alien to the Christian life. 
Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So I need to remember that for myself, but I need to remember that for other people too, because I would sometimes love to gravitate and hold on to something that somebody did to me and feel I have a right to be bitter and angry. And, and all that does is destroy me. It doesn't do a thing for them. And if they're in Christ Jesus, they're free. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So I need to be like Jesus and be forgiving and gracious to people. Uh, certainly there are things we need to talk about. Certainly there are incidences that need to get cleared up. But the condemnation, the, the constant um, bitterness that some people feel that they have a right to hold on to, and it doesn't matter the level of somebody's moral depravity. We don't have a right to hold on to it. And so there is no condemnation. It's good news for me, although it is a bit of a, an issue that I have to die to myself and not hold other people under the same condemnation that I freely accept from Christ. I remember Jesus as he was with the woman that was accused of adultery. Uh, the, it was said that the Pharisees wanted to accuse him of something and they wanted to get him in a corner. And so in the book of John, it's recorded that they find this woman and they throw him before his presence and say, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And the, the, the law of Moses says that we should stone her. What do you say? And they were trying to trap him. And so as he, he's there, he doodles in the dirt. And then when he gets up and he tells them, Jesus had raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. This was after he spoke. He says, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And it says, beginning with the eldest to the last, they all dropped their rocks and walked away. And then it says, Jesus raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, woman, where are your accu these accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you, Go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus promises the light of life by coming to him after this entire incident where there's this bitterness, there's this angry, there's this condemnation towards this woman. And they didn't bring the man who was involved. They didn't go through the proper procedure as is laid out in the law of Moses. They came and tried to trap Jesus with this. And Jesus says, if you come to me, I'll give you light and you'll have the light of life because darkness overshadows a person that is just wrapped up in condemnation. Sometimes we beat ourselves up because we try to pay off our own sins by doing so. And yet, the scripture says it's a free gift of salvation where we receive it. And when we receive God's forgiveness based upon what Jesus did on the cross, it's no longer ours, it's his. And so that's what we do with other people's sins as well. And we don't throw them down in front of the Lord. You can imagine somebody in prayer doing that, much like the Pharisee and the tax collector, kind of throwing somebody under the bus. You know, I pray for this wicked, horrible, terrible person who's doing these wicked, horrible, terrible things. And God forbid it would be in a prayer meeting and made public. But sometimes we reveal what's going on in our hearts with our words and they don't line up with the scripture. If that's the case, you're probably self-condemned. You're probably uh, bound up with condemnation and you don't understand the scriptures clear enough. It's something that we need to really lay hold of if we're gonna show grace and forgiveness towards other people. John 8.36 Later in the same chapter, Jesus says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus promises that through him and him alone, it's inferred in the passage, that you will find freedom from the guilt and the shame of your sin. And it's because of what he did on the cross when we apply it. So, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? By the way, when it says sword, it's, it's not saying that an inanimate object made of steel will separate you. He's talking about execution. Will execution separate us 
from the love of God with the threat of execution. Actually, the author of this was the Holy Spirit through Paul. And Paul suffered execution by becoming decapitated. So it's somewhat prophetic that he would mention this even in the line of what he's speaking. But who shall separate us from the love of God? If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, there are these great separations between these rising sections of land and where the uh, Colorado River runs through. Who can separate us? It, I, I think of this vast chasm that, that's fixed that you're just not going to be able to get over. Who's going to separate us from the love of God? From God expressing his unconditional love toward you in the things that happen to you and the thing that he says to you and the, the things that you have to go through. Understand that it's all God's love working its way out. He hasn't separated from you. He hasn't declared that he doesn't love you anymore. Although you may feel that, you know that it's a lie. Because who can separate us from the love of God? Scripture is very clear. The love of Christ is the very fact that he gave his life for us. That he laid himself down as a sacrificial lamb so that we wouldn't have to die for what we've already done. So tribulation, tribulation, it's a pressing. It's uh, the same word uh, in the original as pressing out grapes or pressing out olive uh, oil. It's this pressing, it's this crushing, it's this pressure that's brought down. So is that going to separate you from the love of God? No, not at all. In fact, if you're going to go through something like that, God will give you the grace to be able to handle it and you will just be home before me. Praise God. Distress. It means going through a narrow way, uh, passageway. If you've ever been in a cave and you have some of these areas where you have to squeeze, uh, I, I'm not very good at that. It's not one of my talents or my gifts. But squeezing, this distress is talking about being squeezed, actually, between two objects. Will that separate us from the love of God? Well, for some people, it does. They go through a persecution or a difficulty. They go through a distressing time, and, and they just say, well, how can God be alive? How can God be at work in my life? How can I be a Christian? How can a loving God allow me to go through such a thing as this? And yet we know all things do work together for good for those who are the called. And so we believe that by faith that God in his love is demonstrating his love through all of the things that happen in our lives. And so these difficult things should never separate us from the love of God, although sometimes we feel like they do, although they do not. And the scriptures are very clear about that. Or persecution, which means being pursued to be harassed. And if you've ever been beaten up by a bully or picked on or that's what he's saying. Will that separate you from the love of God so God is not going to give you his best? Well, no, not at all. Persecution or difficulty in our life is almost promised through the scriptures. If you want to live a holy life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted, Jesus said. And so that's kind of the earmarks of, one, of being a Christian, being a follower. In fact, we should rejoice because we're in good company because so they did to the prophets who were before us. So Jesus tells us that that's how we should look at those difficult situations. Famine, nakedness, and the sword is talking about need. Famine, meaning not having enough food, not having enough sustenance, uh, being malnutritioned, and being without things that we believe are needs. Does that separate us from the love of God? Or if someone's in that situation, does it mean that God doesn't love them? Well, that's a common misconception that a lot of people have. The disciples had it, the, the Old Testament, uh, some of the saints actually had it and had to be corrected. But that somebody is cut off from God because they have need is not a, a true doctrine, at least not always. And so if, if you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, then God's on your team and everything's going well. That is just not true. In fact, Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because you, you just can't take all that stuff with you. And so what's impossible with man is possible with God, Jesus says in the end, which is uh, a great comfort to me. But none of these things will separate us from God. Now, very often people try to uh, 
uh, jump over this great separation. They try to make themselves acceptable to God, make God love them by the things that they do. In fact, most people that have uh, morality in their life, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ are doing just that. They're trying to leap over a chasm uh, because they believe that God's love is to be earned by how high you can jump or how far you can reach. And yet none of those things makes us any more loved. And the lack of those things doesn't make God love us less. It's a matter of us acting out of our new nature that God's given to us and pleasing the Father because he created us for himself. And that's what it is to have a relationship with God. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four to 29, Paul talks about all of the difficulty that he's been through in his life. And he says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 lashes, uh, 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils often, of, uh, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils of false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all of the churches. Who is weak? And I'm not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. He says, I'm not miffed, mad at God about all these things. I've been through all these things but I'm not all twisted up about it. I realize that God's with me and the love of God is not far from me. He's with me and he guides me through all these things. And as far as Paul's concerned, when I, I look at his life and the things that he suffered for Christ and all of the good that he did by starting churches and uh, being the, the author primarily of the majority of the New Testament, I think, my goodness, whatever sacrifice it is that I make is so minor, so small. And if I'm going to be separated from the love of God by these small little pesky things, then that really is a commentary on how strong my faith is and how strong my relationship with Christ is. So when I think of Paul and he goes, well, who's, who's weak? And I'm not weak. So it's almost like, uh, so what have you got? You got something difficult? You got people who are mad at you. Well, that's a big deal. And that crushes you? Or you, you don't have enough to, to make your bills this month and that's crushing you? or you just had an accident with your car, or you just got sick with COVID, or what do you got? I, I wouldn't trade with this list. And yet Paul understood that God was with him and he was working all these things together for good. And he just kept going like the ever ready bunny. We can do that, but it's only when we walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. In Acts 20 verses 22 to 24, Paul saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders says this, he says, and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, I'm going to continue to go. Now, I know that the Holy Spirit tells me that where I'm going, there's going to be difficulty and persecutions. I'm going to go. None of these things move me. I'm not going to change my mind. I have my mind set on doing what the Lord would have me do. And he goes, I don't know what's going to happen, except the Holy Spirit tells me, expect the worst. And guess what? The previous list was the worst. All those things that happened to him. But he goes and he ends up having to go to Caesar. He wanted to go to Rome to preach the gospel. And it turns out that he got a free trip because he got arrested and he got sent on Roman's dime. It's a pretty good idea. The Lord worked it out for good. And he says, none of these things move me. I think about the life of David. David started out very well as a hero. He was a young boy. He went and cut off Goliath's head. And, you know, uh, he was a hero as a young boy. But then later on, King David kind of fell into some difficulty with the Lord and he was somewhat distanced. And what ends up happening with David is he goes on the roof in spring of the year and kings go to war. He's up on the roof and he sleeps till noon and he steps out and 
behold, there's a naked woman and she happens to be married and he doesn't care. And he goes about his, he goes about to deceit and lies and adultery and murder. He goes through all of these things. And yet none of those things separated him from the love of God. And most people think about that. And you know, it's, it's easy to look at David and go, shame on David for what David did. And yet he, he wrote some of the most awesome passages that we could ever read about the love of God that he experienced. And he says, it's, it's a wonderful thing when God doesn't point the finger at you and accuse you. And he says, if there was a sacrifice I could have made, I would have made it. But the sacrifices of God are a, a humble and contrite spirit. And there's no way that the Lord's going to turn out somebody like that. So David himself understood that nothing could separate him from the love of God. No one and nothing. Verse 36, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. That's actually from Psalm 44, verse 20. Psalm 44 is a, a passage where David is kind of crying out and he's saying, you know, where are you, God? We're, we're not in sin or anything, but our enemies are coming and trampling over us. Uh, what's going on here? And yet he remembered the love of God. And he says, we're like sheep every day. And, and Paul is reiterating, he says, that's the way our life is. We're, we're like sheep to the slaughter. That's the life we live. And yet we know the love of God that still burns in our hearts. It's not something we've forgotten or we think doesn't exist. It's there. And so that's how we live. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown in the fire fir fiery furnace. Even that tribulation, that difficulty when they were, uh, you know, they kind of blacklisted and they were thrown into the fire uh, when they, they wouldn't bow down and worship uh, a giant golden idol like everyone else did. And they got tossed in the fire. And it says that there was one in there that was like the son of man. And there were four in the fire when only th three were thrown in. And then they were called to come out and they came out whole and unburned. And not even their clothes smelled like fire, but the ropes that bound them burned. And yet they didn't have a singe on their hair, on their head. And obviously God protected them. So did that kind of persecution separate them from the love of God? No, not at all. In fact, the Lord was with them right there as they went through all that. And he'll be there for us as well. If we'll call out to him and if we can remember these passages and claim them and come before God with them, boy, we'll go through it a whole lot better than if we didn't. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What is more than a conqueror? A conqueror is one who wins and has absolute and total victory in every respect. What is more than a conqueror? See, more than a conqueror is when you're going through the difficult time, the hardship, and you can rejoice anyway. When you know that you're going to win the battle in the middle of the battle, that's what it is to be more than a conqueror. Most people think it's about finishing, uh, you know, having everything that you want, and therefore you're a conqueror because you got everything you want. And most people think that that's what it is to conquer, is to go and take something by force and claim it as your own and take it away from somebody else. That's kind of the perception that we have. And yet, most people don't think of the biblical model, which is a conqueror is one who stands fast doing those things that God would have them do, even in the midst of the battle, even in the midst of the difficulty. Or like Job, where he cries out to God and he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, that's more than a conqueror. He didn't get everything he wanted. In fact, everything he didn't want is what he received, but he realized that God was in control of his life. That's what it is to be more than a conqueror. That's why John the Baptist at the end of his life forfeited his head. But in the middle of that, he questioned and he sent a message to Jesus. He says, are you the one that we're waiting for or should we expect another? And Jesus said, send back to him and tell him the things that are being done. The blind see, the lame walk, you know, lepers are healed. He sends all of this back to John to confirm to him that he is the one who he should be. And John ends up having to forfeit his head just for a young girl who danced and demanded it. Because John the Baptist shot his mouth off and spoke the truth and uh, 
maybe he didn't do it lovingly all the time, but he told the truth and he forfeited his head for it. It was put on a silver platter and given as a gift. That's what it is to be more than a conqueror. It's to overcome the challenges and in the midst of the challenges, know that God's got your back and that all things work together for good, that those that love him. And then in this great last section, he says, for I am persuaded. By the way, that's not a, it's not a mental thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a heart decision. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So that's a pretty extensive list. He begins by talking about life or death. You know, some people say, you know, if I die, I know I'm going to go to heaven and I almost wish that the Lord would take me because then I know I'll be with the Lord. Well, even if you have to live in some sort of state that is undesirable or that you didn't choose, you're not going to escape the love of God, even in a difficult situation for the rest of your life. Death, I think pretty much we understand once death hits and it's the finality of all of us, there's, there's no more struggle in this body and we're, we're going to be with the Lord and been given a new body. So it's all good. But he says that neither death nor life because life sometimes can be difficult to deal with. Nor angels, nor principalities or powers. These are those in the unseen realm. And that would include Satan, by the way. So that means the devil can't take you away from the love of God either. So the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. And he can't take you away from the love of God either. Which means my salvation is secure. And it doesn't depend upon my own behavior. It depends on a promise that God made and a sacrifice that Jesus took to the cross. Nothing, principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things to come. That means there's nothing you're going through now and there's nothing that can ever come in the future. So that covers time. So we've covered the supernatural realm. We've talked about life and death. Now he's talking about time. There's nothing at the present time or anything in the future because the past can't separate you from the love of God because it's behind you anyway but the present nor the future, that you have nothing to worry about with God's showing his love toward you in the present and in the future, or that his hand has somehow come, up, come off of you or that he doesn't love you anymore. It doesn't matter whether it's today or it's tomorrow. His love is going to endure. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. So he's talking about things that are created, obstacles that we might have, something to get over or something to get under. There's no such thing as any created thing. And by the way, you're a created thing, which means I can't keep myself away from the love of God. My salvation does not rest with me. It rests in Jesus's hands. And the father who gave me to him is stronger than all. And so I never worry about anybody escaping Jesus's hand. So that's called eternal security. And I believe in it because the scripture teaches it. Nothing. No other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us. Chapter eight began by saying there is no condemnation. That means there's nobody who's going to point the finger at you and say that you are unfit for the kingdom of God because, well, we all know that we're none of us are. And yet we aren't being judged on that we're being judged upon what Jesus did. So there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the shame is done away with. We see that there is no accusation. Who will bring an accusation against God's elect? It's, it's Christ who died. It's God's the one who justifies us. So who's going to point the finger at you and yell that you're guilty and that you have no right? Well, of course you have no right, but I do because of Jesus. And that's the gospel that we preach. It's not that, you know, I found Jesus and now I'm a good enough person. I'm, I'm still a foul, horrible person. And yet Jesus is in the midst of rebuilding me and making me like himself, not because of anything that I've realized or understood, but because I've given my life away to him and I've decided to stop fighting him. And so the guilt, the condemnation is not there anymore. There is no consternation. Oh, by the way, that's a real word. Consternation means alarm, amazement, terror, fright, dismay, panic, or sudden fear. 
Because we know from Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, for the called according to his purpose. So I'm not going to get all twisted up about sudden calamity that might strike me. I, I've waken up a couple of mornings uh, and, or in, in the middle of the morning when it's still dark out, like two in the morning, coughing. And I go, oh my goodness, I got the COVID virus. I'm going to die. Well, I'm going to be separated from the love of God? No, of course not. And God's going to be right there with me if I, if I go through something like that or if I'm hospitalized. Or, so if any of that happens to me, you can pray for me, but you know, you don't have to be all twisted up and carried around and, and mourn and you, you know, it's okay. The Lord's with me and it's good. And he's with you. Whatever it is that you're going through, the Lord's with you. But we forget sometimes and we think we're alone. But see, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing. You can't run far enough. You can't dig deep enough. You can't climb a mountain high enough to get away from God. You just can't. And that's what the passage says. And there is no separation. There is no separation from us and God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Paul was very clear to be emphatic about all of these things. The supernatural can't separate you. Difficult times, hardship, persecution, distress, none of these things can separate you from the love of Christ, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I hope you will take these things to the bank. I hope you will take them into your heart and that you will live them out, that you might memorize even from verse 28 on, or the entire chapter, if you're, if you're like my friend Brian Walter, uh, just take it on because it is the crux of what it is to live for Christ, to be at peace with him and to know that every single thing in our life has a purpose. It's unseen sometimes, but we know that it's there and that God will never separate us from himself. There's no way we can be separated from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these also he called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivering him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long and we are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord." I pray that you know that. I pray that you live it. I pray that you put it somewhere in your heart where it's going to grow because there are yet pages yet to be turned in your life. I think if we grab a hold of this, we'll begin to understand who our Heavenly Father is and what He wants to do with our life. And I just pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to hide this word in our heart, that we might not sin against you by being unbelieving, by being faithless, and by being weak, by focusing in on this world alone and not the next. Help us, Lord, to be committed. Help us to be given over to you. In Jesus' name, amen.